Today's video, we're going to be looking at global population in the form of the different types of densities that we can use to describe the distribution of population over the Earth's surface. Uh, in class, uh, we talked a little bit about this, the fact that we have now crossed 7 billion in global population. Um, now we're going to talk about how it's distributed. Um, in terms of terms and concepts, uh, we're going to talk about the five twos that human populations generally avoid. Um, we're going to look at population density, physiological density, and agricultural density. So when we talked about population in general and, and talked about the 7 billion threshold that we crossed recently, um, we also started to look at where those population centers are. And if we take some general um, statements about where those populations are, we're going to see that about two-thirds of the population lives within 300 miles of the coast. We're also going to see that most populations or higher populations are going to live in more temperate um, climate zones. We're also going to see um, about 90 percent of the population uh, is above the equator, north of the equator. And an increasing um, a phenomenon incre increasing in the world today is the fact that populations are becoming increasingly urban. So with those generalizations, we can also talk about what then the five things that humans avoid or human populations tend to avoid in terms of large concentrations anyway. So we can look at um, conditions that are too hot. It simply is just too difficult to maintain daily activities through uh, in the environments and to support a large population. We can look at uh, conditions or climates that are too cold. Uh, obviously, this is an extreme. This is taking uh, an image from the the Arctic, the last one being from the Sahara. You know, the too hot and too cold, just the extremeness of the, of the temperatures changes human activity and the ability to support populations. Another one that humans avoid is when it's too wet. Um, those conditions uh, breed disease that also makes it, again, difficult for daily activities, um, natural disasters for providing um, food supplies. Basic everyday life can be disrupted um, in conditions where it's too wet. Conversely, too dry is another factor. Not only this often goes hand in hand with uh, heat, but it can be also, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the most um, frigid or hot or desert climates. It can just simply be dry, dry conditions in which make it very difficult to support, again, human population. And then finally, the last one we can look at would be too high. Just at, at increased elevations, we have a thinner atmosphere. It's, again, you're not going to see as prevalent uh, agriculture and it's going to be more difficult to sustain uh, human life or human society. So generally those are the five twos you're going to see, too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, and too high as being those five things that human societies avoid. So when we go back to our world population distribution, we can start identifying some characteristics knowing our five twos um, where population is going to avoid, but also then looking at what they would also gravitate towards. And we talked in class about the five major population regions. And what they all have in common, generally speaking, is accessibility, um, access to resources, uh, in, importantly, an uh, important factor being fresh water, and a mo relatively moderate climate. So if we look at China, we can see the Yellow and Yangtze River, uh, Wangho uh, River. We can also look at uh, the Ganges River Valley in India. Another uh, look at population where you see the most densely populated areas across India are in these river valleys. Again, supporting with fresh water, also uh, for agricultural or irrigation purposes. That being said, we can also look at then population centers uh, by development of electricity. So when we looked at this image earlier in the semester, um, electricity or the lights that uh, designate these areas are also happen to be correspond with these high population areas and or highly developed areas of the world. That brings us to our three other uh, major concepts or terms, population density, physiological density, and agricultural density. Starting with ag uh, arithmetic density, this is going to, when we start looking at this, is just the population um, uh, per square mile. So when we look at the idea of population density, we can look at just the, the arithmetically or, or by, by um, the mathematical concept of just taking a population divided by the, the land area, whether it's miles or kilometers, but it's just looking at the number of people per square mile. And so we can see this arithmetic density or population density based on just space. And you can see that as a, by, by just looking at the map, you can see that uh, India is relatively dense in terms of arithmetic de densities. Um, 
when we go to physiological density, now we're, we're considering what can support these populations. And physiological density is population divided by the square miles of arable land or farmable land. In order to support a large population, you have to be able to farm and grow your own food and support um, the population with food. Physiological density gives us a better or more accurate representation of what is possible because in many places around the world there is significant uh, tracts of land or uh, square miles where the land is not arable or useful for hu to support human populations. So what we would want is a relatively, um, you know, when we look at population over arable land, you know, we want to consider this relative co uh, consideration when comparing different countries and seeing what is the population and how many square, you know, how, how many people are supported by each mile, square mile of, of arable land. The smaller the number, the better in terms of its ability to support. The greater the po physiological density means that there's more human population being supported by one piece or one square mile of land than other places in the world. Finally, agricultural density. And when we look at agricultural density, we're now talking specifically about farmers per square mile of arable land. Now this is going to give us a different perspective. We're no longer just looking at whether or not land can be farmed and how many people it supports, but how many people it takes or farmers it takes to actually make that land useful and grow the food that's needed for the human population. Agricultural density works the other way in that we, we are looking at a small, we want a small number in the sense of um, we don't want very many farmers. The more developed a country is, the more likely you're going to have few farmers. For example, the United States is incredibly advanced in terms of its agricultural practices, and the agriculture, agricultural density is going to be very, very different than if we looked at, um, for example, a subsistence uh, society that is smart, um, several people or lots of farmers farming a very small plot of land. And so when we look at the overall perspective, um, we again, we would want a very small number, but that's actually in this case is going to be a very important or a, a reflection more of development um, about that particular society or country um, relative to other places in the world. So hopefully that we're going to use these tomorrow. Hopefully that was helpful in, in explaining the different types of density, population densities that we can look at given the distribution of people around the world and also some basic uh, background on what um, are the conditions that human societies are going to avoid in terms of uh, l large populations.